Well, thank, thanks everyone. We're from Wisconsin. Um, but it, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we'll, we'll skip that for now, although do look at Dave's tie. Uh, I'll be tag teaming this talk with my good friend and collaborator Dave O'Connor. And we're going to talk about emerging infections. And it was not too long ago when the world used to be happy and healthy and a fun place. And then people like us came along and pretty much changed that permanently for everybody. And if you look at the origins of this story, I, I, I've, here I've plotted the phrase emerging infectious diseases as a frequency of publications in PubMed by year. And you can see this precipitous rise in the frequency of that phrase between the uh, early 1990s and the, late, and the early 2000s. And that's really, I think, when, when Dave and I came of age intellectually. And th that, that rise in the popularity of that phrase, I think, really reflects the awareness of the remarkable story of the zoonotic origins of the AIDS viruses. So this is really the, the formative intellectual uh, discovery of, of, of my career, and I think it's probably safe to say Dave's as well. Um, and we had sort of a, a, a nice convergent career evolution as, as a consequence. So here we've made little collages of some of the influential people and teams in our, in our careers. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the specifics. Dave, Dave may want to later. but. Uh, it's safe to say that uh, you know, Dave's world sort of came from the, the primatology, the, la the laboratory infectious disease immunogenetics realm, and mine was more from the, the realm of field biology and primatology. So ecology and laboratory science sort of converging unbeknownst to each other because we didn't actually meet until 2008. And it was really 2009 that we got off the ground to, to forge a One Health coalition. Um, with Dave's remarkable expertise in genomics, cellular immunity, RNA virus pathogenesis. Dave studied with uh, David Watkins. Um, and Dave has developed an, an international reputation in DNA sequencing and immunogenetics, including developing the Mauritian macaque model of HIV. Uh, my background is in ecology, epidemiology, and evolution of infectious diseases, and again, from a field primatology background, and I still work in Uganda. So I'm going to just start out with the origins of our collaboration, which for me at least, uh, began with this field site that I've worked in for many years in the western part of Uganda. It's a national park called Kibali. That's a remarkably biodiverse area with a long history of primate research, a high rate of human population growth, and, and all sorts of other things that make it very attractive as a field site for studying diseases in, in wild populations. And prior to moving to Wisconsin in 2008 and, and having the pleasure of meeting and beginning to collaborate with Dave, Dave, we already knew that there were unknown viruses in the monkeys in this population. This is serologic evidence for some type of novel pox virus with partial immunological cross-reactivity to monkeypox, vaccinia, and cowpox, but imperfect uh, cross-reactivity on Western blot to either of them. And we still don't know what the agent is, but we had these clues that there were new viruses um, one of my early collaborators in this field was Bill Switzer at the CDC, who does uh, non-human primate retrovirus discovery for a living. And we collaborated to discover new simian immunodeficiency viruses, simian T-cell lymphotrophic viruses, and uh, simian foamy viruses in this remarkable primate community, uh, including some animals that were infected with all three. And that, that led to our current R01 funding. Uh, to study these in natural populations to understand how they might evolve and emerge out of those populations. And so, so it was sort of armed with that background information that Dave and I got together. And, and this is the result of a, a lot of work in Dave's lab, really, uh, because Dave, Dave is a you know, cutting edge researcher in the use of deep sequencing technology. So with, with, with Dave's expertise, we're able to design a pathogen, a virus discovery pipeline. To, to take the broadest possible look at the viruses that might be in this remarkably diverse population of primates that had never been systematically surveyed before. And this, if this slide looks scary and complex, that's really its main purpose, um, to show the, the depth of Dave's expertise in these types of methods. So to skip to the, to the, to the re to the end result, this is a picture of the virodiversity or the, the community diversity of RNA viruses in the blood serum of a wild population 
wild community, multi-species population of African primates. And you can see a lot of dots. Each one represents a virus. And every dot is a story. And clearly, we don't have time to go through the dots, although I'm going to let Dave go through some of the more interesting dots when he talks about this. But um, the, each of these viruses is new, and each of them is a remarkable story. The one, the one I'll touch on from this particular population is that in our efforts to, in the very first monkey we ever sequenced using this technology, affectionately known as Scarface, or RC, red column is zero, 01, we, we stumbled upon the first natural reservoir of a virus that had been a mystery since 1964, simian hemorrhagic fever virus, or actually a divergent variant of the type strain. And there are four of these in the, uh, in the monkeys of Kibale National Park, two in the red colobus, two in the red tail monkeys. And I'm, I'll let Dave talk more about this, except as a, an example of the types of uh, projects that this, these collaborations can lead to, we're now in a very fruitful collaboration I'll, I'll, I'll skip this, but we're in a very proof collaboration with uh, intramural NIH researchers with Pete Jarling's group at the Integrated Research Facility at Fort Detrick to explore the simian arteriviruses, the, the relatives of the type strain of simian hemorrhagic fever virus in a macaque model. And all this slide is meant to show you is that we have been able to infect macaques and we've gotten a lot of clinical data through our collaborators at NIH IRF. Um, and the, the bottom line is that the viruses appear to vary in the clinical effects that they cause in infected animals. They, but in general, they, they uh, grow to very high titer. They're, they're, the type strain is 100% lethal in Asian macaques, but appears to be able to cause very few, if any, clinical effects in its natural host, despite the fact that it replicates to extremely high titer. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. And again, every one of those dots I showed is a story that is like this or has the potential. But one of the advantages I've found in working in this One Health collaboration is that it opened opportunities for me as an ecologist and a disease modeler to understand the diversity of pathogens that might make it into people. So my field research in Uganda right now is focused on social science and how people in nature actually interact with primates. So this is a forest edge. And you can see the houses next to the forest. And in the forest, there are monkeys that have their social networks. And outside of the forest, there are people who live in their social networks. And the focus of my research right now in the field, catalyzed by some of our collaborative findings, is to identify the nodes in the human social network that are a particular risk of contacting primates. And then if we know the structure of these types of networks, we should be able to model how a pathogen might go through the human social network and eventually out into the world. I cannot tell you how long that animation took. <laughs> um, so before I turn it over to Dave, I just want to say that One Health collaborations have benefit for all the reasons we're talking about, the, the novelty of perspective, the diversity of skills and techniques, but they also lead to really interesting spin-offs. In the middle of our collaborations, we were approached by veterinarians at the Milwaukee County Zoo because a beloved orangutan had suddenly and unexpectedly died. This was Mahal. Uh, born in Colorado, rejected by a surrogate mother, flown on a private jet to Milwaukee, where he was adopted, sorry, rejected by his birth mother, flown by a, a private jet to Milwaukee, where he was adopted by a surrogate mother, and then he uh, suddenly and unexpectedly died, much to the dismay of the Milwaukee community. And histology of this case was completely inconclusive. All we knew was some sort of eukaryotic parasite but we had no idea, not, and the world's best parasitologists could not figure this out. So the differential diagnosis list was really unenviable, it could, anything with a nucleus. Um, <laughs> and so I, I was presented with this case. I, I, I'd already shot my mouth off that I'd be able to help, so I couldn't turn back. So I, I called up Dave, and we, and we brainstormed this, and wound up adapting this virus discovery method to the case of this orangutan, in this case, looking at DNA rather than RNA, and it was fortunate that the orangutan genome was sequenced. Uh, so we were able to subtract that out and see what remained that was not orangutan. And the results were a lot of sequences, almost all of them orangutan, except for just a few that had some similarity to the pork tapeworm. Now, this was not the pork tapeworm, but it gave us enough of a clue that we could design 
uh, barcoding primers to this branch of the Tanead tapeworm phylogenetic tree that contains the two known genera, Tania and Echinococcus. And with that, we're able to sequence this pathogen and find out that it was neither. And that it actually sorted with a third clade of Tanead tapeworm that here I have, uh, it's in red there, it begins with the letter V. It turns out right when we we're doing this work, this paper was published in International Journal for Parasitology proposing a new genus of Tanea tapeworm, Versteria, named after the famous tapeworm biologist Anna Verster. Learn all sorts of interesting things in the world of One Health. Um, but we had stumbled upon the first known fatal case of Versteria infection in a primate. Um, and now we, there's, we have a mini sort of research project on Versteria as this potentially emerging tapeworm, and we're very, very much involved with, among other people, the uh, U.S. National Parasite Collection. Yes, we have one, and guess what? It's right here in Bethesda, Maryland. So these things come full circle. Uh, and we're doing outbreak investigation to look at definitive host sources of infection, mechanism of pathogenesis. So this, th this orangutan was infected with the larval stages of this tapeworm, which insists in the tissues, and in a normal situation, like in a rodent, it would just sit quiescent. But for some reason, we don't understand, it grew out of control and killed this particular animal. So it's just a nice example of the spin-offs that these things can lead to. So we've hit upon this already. In the, in, in, when you talk about One Health, there's really two definitions. And I used to think about these as separate. So the first is ecology and health, linkages among human health, animal health, plant health, and the environment. Um, terms like planetary health are emerging. And the second definition that I've, I've uh, heard, that of course is widely accepted is comparative medicine animal models of human disease, human model of animal disease. And I always saw a bit of a schism between these. But through working with Dave, I realized that there isn't. And that understanding diseases in nature, their ecology and how they interact with the environment, is perfectly relevant to comparative medicine and vice versa. So I'm going to stop there and repeat this slide uh, and turn it over to Dave, who's going to pick up with some of these, uh, these, these directions that we're going today. Like tag team, like in professional wrestling? Okay. Or basketball. Or basketball. Well, but we don't want to talk about that. Um, right. So, so um, I, I think Tony laid out um, a lot of where uh, our collaboration started, and I'll take it just one a little uh, a little bit further uh, and say that when we started this collaboration, Tony uh, came to us naively uh, with all the work that he had been doing in Kabali for a long time. Um, and he, he was looking for some help uh, looking at, uh, to see whether there are any viruses in any of these sa uh, samples that he had been collecting painstakingly over a number of years. Uh, and then a third collaborator of ours, Tom Friedrich, uh, also of the University of Wisconsin, uh, was, was involved, and he's an, an expert virologist. And we sort of had this idea that one thing we might be able to do uh, that would be a little unique in, in emerging infectious diseases, there's, a, there's actually uh, a lot of people who are out there collecting samples of, of various, various things that walk, slither, fly, whatever. Um, and there's a lot of people who are doing uh, sequencing-based uh, discovery of, of pathogens in an unbiased way. Um, but there aren't very many people who um, are intersecting those with um, uh, model systems where you could assess and really take that work to the next level. Um, and because of our uh, proximity to the uh, Wisconsin National Primate Research Center, we realized that by focusing on primates and looking at primate viruses uh, that would emerge in nature, we would have the opportunity to model cross-species transmission, uh, not necessarily into people, uh, but, but into macaque monkeys. So macaque monkeys are Asian macaques. We're here looking at African monkeys. If a virus or a pathogen has the ability to jump from an African primate into an Asian macaque, uh, that might be able to teach us interesting lessons about what sort of host barriers might exist for those same viruses or pathogens jumping from African monkeys into human populations. And so that was where we thought we might have a unique uh, uh, advantage um, in, in a, a niche that we, that we could fill. And it turns out that uh, a couple of these cases that we have uh, been exploring over the last few years um, in, embody this very nicely. So I'll start by talking about these uh, sim arteri viruses, uh, as, as Tony um, alluded to them. We also call them the simian arteri viruses 
or the SHFVs. And the, and the reason for that um, is because, as Tony alluded to, uh, these viruses have been known since the 1960s uh, as a major cause of uh, captive uh, macaque uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, and in fact, let's see which key thing is it. Over the course of uh, about the last 50 years, there's been more than 20 outbreaks of what are called SHFV among captive primates around the world. And so you see a map of them here. So starting in the 1960s, there were simultaneous outbreaks uh, in the United States and in Armenia. Um, and uh, these, these were all called SHFV outbreaks. And what we've discovered um, since we began uh, looking at these viruses more intently is that, in fact, uh, these outbreaks are not caused by, by one virus, one SHFV, SHFV uh, but rather uh, by different simian arteriviruses. And so um, here you see a phylogenetic tree of, of the arteriviruses uh, in different species, and then here are the simian arteriviruses specifically. Uh, and what you can see is that here we have the Kabali red colobus, uh, here we have the... Uh, uh, here we have baboons from Tanzania, uh, red-tailed guenons from Kabale, and then in amongst those we have the type strain uh, that caused SHFV in captive, uh, in, in captive animals uh, at NIH. And then here is another strain uh, that came from an outbreak in New Mexico. And increasingly we're converging on this picture that you have this SHFV is actually a, a misnomer because you have captive primate outbreaks that all caused uh, these hemorrhagic fever uh, diseases, but they were caused potentially by different viruses in, among the simian arteriviruses. And so this now creates an interesting, an interesting system where we can explore some of the mechanisms of uh, what makes something a viral hemorrhagic fever, because we know now from our work looking at these um, viruses and their natural hosts that there are some animals that harbor these, these viruses quite contentedly and seem to have no ill effects. And among these are, are the baboons. So we've found um, baboons both in the wild and in captivity in Southwest's uh, National Primate Research Center that harbor simian arteriviruses with no, with no clinical disease. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have these macaque monkeys that despite being infected with different simian arteriviruses, uh, tend to have very severe uh, frank, frank disease. And so you can begin to imagine scenarios where you do things like take the same virus that you find in baboons and experimentally inoculate baboons and macaque monkeys and look at the differential uh, host factors, di differential pathogenesis that could lead to uh, these sorts of different types of outcomes against the same virus and perhaps provide insights into the sort of mechanisms that govern uh, the development of hemorrhagic fevers in people. And so the second example I'm going to talk about is uh, with a type of virus uh, called a pegivirus, which if you don't know, um, you're fully excused for not knowing about the pegiviruses because frankly, when we first learned about them, we, we didn't care about them much either. Uh, and so when we started working with it, we began to see these viruses um, that were very similar, uh, that were arising in multiple of the spe species that we were looking at in Kabale. Uh, and they were most similar to the human pegivirus, which is also known as, as GB virus C. And GB virus C is a very interesting virus in that it's probably the world's most prevalent RNA virus. About one in six people worldwide are thought to have or have had uh, GB virus C. Uh, but it doesn't, the reason a sixth of you in this room have had this virus and probably don't care is it doesn't seem to cause disease. So people tend to get infected with it. They maintain a persistent viremia that can be quite high, a million copies of virus per mil of, uh, in blood plasma. Um, but it doesn't seem to cause any disease. And in fact, what GB virus C is most well known for is in people who have HIV as well as GBVC, the GBVC seems to uh, confer some kind of reduction in all-cause mortality um, that is thought to be related to a, a reduction in immune activation that's mediated by, by this GB virus C. Um, as, as it was put to me at, a, at, a, at a, a Passover Seder I was attending on Friday, it's kind of like citalopram for the, uh, the, the immune system. And it, it, um, it really seems to be a, 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 it just dampens the immune response, 
and that can have salutary effects against viruses uh, where the pathogenesis is caused by having too much uh, over-exuberant immune activation. And since we were able to find these viruses um, in, in monkeys, we were able to start asking some interesting questions about these PEGI viruses. So the human GB virus C uh, only infects humans and chimpanzees. There's been dozens of attempts to generate an animal model for this over the last 20 years, uh, all of which have been, have been unsuccessful. Uh, but we reasoned that because you might have a smaller species barrier to jump to go from African primates into Asian ones, we might be able to use these viruses that we found in the wild to um, create an animal model in the lab. And so to do this, we took um, a plasma from a yellow baboon and from an olive baboon, and we inoculated it into two synomologous macaques. And remarkably, uh, both of these viruses re, uh, infected the macaques and recapitulated several key features of human GB virus C infection. Um, a high titer, persistent infection uh, with no overt signs of disease. Uh, and interestingly, when we sequenced the, 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 these viruses, we anticipated that there would be a lot of host adaptation that would be necessary in order for these viruses to replicate, but that was not the case. Over uh, almost a thousand days of monitoring uh, several animals, there was one consensus level mutation of, of, of note that occurred in about half of the animals. So the, the, these baboon viruses did not need to adapt very much to, to replicate in macaques. So those are the two stories I'm going to talk about, but in the last few minutes I wanted to make sure that um, I, I asked a few provocative questions that Tony and I brainstormed last week. Um, and made sure that we had left plenty of time for discussion. Uh, and one of the, the things is we've now been working for five years. So, um, of course, you know, Tony and I are, are great friends. We, we get along great. We've been working together a long time. Um, but after five years, like in any relationship, you begin to, you, the, the, the initial luster uh, and honeymoon phase has worn off. And so you, you begin, no offense, Tony. I, I'm sorry to make it so public. It's, it's so Facebook official. But, um, you know, let's... Let's talk about some of the issues we've, we've encountered. And, and some of these are really serious issues that aren't going to be uh, apparent right when you start a collaboration and everyone's really excited about it, but only become apparent later on. So of course, one of them is sustainability. And sustainability in our world equals funding, right? Um, and what we've discovered is that there, there, there seem to be, at NIH, few what we would consider you know, one health-friendly programs. And, and when I say this, what I mean is that Individually, you know, in our own domains, I would say that in my lab's about 10 years old. I've had a, a pretty good run of getting funding through ORIP and NIAD. And I would say that fewer than, I've had one grant in 10 years uh, that was not scored uh, and, and wasn't discussed at a study section out of a, a pretty large denominator. And I think Tony has told me that the same is true in, in, in his realm. And yet, the two grants that we put in where we were co-PIs, uh, both got both got triaged. Uh, now it could be that we have spectacularly bad ideas, and I'm the first one to to open to say that, or that we work very poorly together, and that the grants are actually worse than the sum of their parts, and that's fine too. Um, but it, it 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 seems like one of the things that we've seen in summary statements and in the discussions arising from these grants is this concern that well the investigators are fantastic. It's it's really innovative. Um, but then we get, uh, we get really hammered on the approach uh, because reviewers have seemed to have a hard time um, getting their heads around this idea that field research and laboratory uh, animal research uh, can be two sides of the same coin. And they either don't like the, the field component, the ecology, the disease ecology, looking at uh, these issues in, in the wild, um, or they don't like the fact that we're using this ecological data, this, this, this wild data, to, to do things in the laboratory. Uh, and, it's, and it's been uh, a challenge, and it's one that Tony and I spend a lot of time talking about, is like, what are we doing wrong? Uh, but also, I, I think that, you know, clearly, um, some of it is, is idea-centric, and it's, of course, a, you can't read too much into anecdotes with small numbers of grants in this kind of funding climate, but it's something that's certainly worrisome. Uh, one of the things that I think is worth talking about is the fact that there's uh, that over time there's been a develop a, a sort of an overlapping of intellectual interests and skill sets. So when we first started this project, um, you know, 
uh, Tony comes into the lab like Indiana Jones, you know, with the sample, these, these samples that he's collected in the wild. And, uh, you know, a year or two later, uh, T Tom Friedrich and I go over and visit him, and it's, oh my God, he, he actually is like Indiana Jones. It's like stepping into a National Geographic uh, special to visit Tony in the field in Kabale, you know, with a dart gun slung over his shoulder, you know, hiking into the bush to collect these samples. And from a guy who sits in front of a computer all day, and you know, a, you know, a, a big trek usually means going to the coffee shop for an iced tea. This is a big change uh, from my you know day-to-day -day worldview. But as time's gone on, we've begun to, uh, to 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 overlap. You know, as I talk about these stories with people like Preston Marks uh, from Tulane or Christian Apatry, uh Jeff Rogers, these are some of my collaborators in in, in sort of SIV world. Um, we discovered that there was, you know, a lot of other samples existing throughout Africa that I was very interested in studying. And then I've also had a long-standing translational research program in Brazil where there's an interest in studying New World monkeys. So, so, so my lab is interested in characterizing uh, pathogens using some of these deep sequencing techniques in some of these other populations. While at the same time, Tony has become more proficient in the, the deep sequencing. So his lab now has a MySeq, is now able to do the same sort of pathogen discovery work in, in his lab. Um, it, it doesn't undercut our collaboration or mean that we're drifting apart, but it means that as time has gone on, our interests have begun in that Venn diagram that was shown in the first talk. You begin to see you know, things emerging at the edges, um, you know, projects emerging at the edges, which is natural and it's good, um, but it also uh, uh, provides, you know, as a challenge if you set up a, a, a collaboration that's too, that's too static. Um, there's certainly been differences in domain-specific research practices. Uh, I think that the world that Tony uh, comes from and inhabits has different uh, ways of doing things, even in things like uh, publications. So, you know, just for one, one concrete example, because I know he's in the audience, uh, you know, I'm on a, a paper with Jim Hoxie, our previous speaker, uh, and as is customary in uh, the SIV pathogenesis field, you receive a draft that gets prepared by the laboratory that's putting it together, and that you get it at a late stage, you provide comments, and then it gets submitted. In Tony's world, there's usually a much more involved uh, process where all of the authors are involved, carve out their roles before any writing begins. That's been a, a challenge. Um, and then finally, blending you know, lab and field science and making sure that everyone who's involved in the project at all levels um, is a stakeholder who has in involvement in all aspects of the project. So I'll just conclude by reiterating Tony's first slide of one health, two teams, good science. Um, and I'll thank you. And then hopefully there will be some time for uh, questions. Thank you. I'm really sad to hear that your relationship is, is evolving the way it has. <laughs> I hope you guys remain in love. But I wonder, uh, will any children result from this relationship? And are you, are you, do you feel you're training students between the two of you that see the overlap? And, and will they become this future generation that this will be second nature for them? Or are you fairly separate there? Yeah, actually, that's been one of the absolute great things uh, about this collaboration is that uh, from the outset, the first person who was working on this project intensively in my lab was a uh, graduate student named Michael Locke. And Michael, I, I can say uh, without any embellishment, was jointly trained by, by me and Tony. Um, and I think, you know, he now does phylogenetics methods that Tony knows that I have no idea even what he's doing. Um, and we have had a number of students who are in each lab who have been embedded physically in the other person, the other group's labs. Uh, so we've done that, um, and I, I think it's going. I think it's going well. Um, but you know, again, I think the the challenge there, in the interest of, of full disclosure, is that you know you you can sometimes it, it's difficult for a student to have multiple uh, direct reports, especially when you're talking about PI mentors, uh, because ultimately the person, a student, is going to have to make some decisions. And they have to have someone to go to. And when they have two people to go to, they sometimes can feel caught in the middle. But I think it's generally gone quite well. But just, and just to add one thing, the, the one, one area I wish we had is we haven't yet had an African student come and work in both of our labs. And that's something that's near and dear to my heart. So I'd like that to, to be something we do in the future.
Perhaps as a follow-up and a comment, Mike Larimore from UC Davis, um, one of the areas that we talked about is, is the next generation. I think that's going to be a common theme. Uh, we've created an undergraduate course in global disease biology, but it was with the plant biology group. And we're finding that students that are attracted to the ecology piece of that are really attracted to, to you know, coming in that route for that. Uh, do you have undergraduate courses also that, that blend um, at Wisconsin, blend some of your uh, various interests? Yeah, we do. Um, so I'm, I'm the research director of our Global Health Institute of Wisconsin. And we have a, 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 m a number of courses across campus on wildlife disease, emerging disease, one health, these issues. D Dave team teaches a course with Tom Friedrich, who we mentioned, on, on HIV AIDS. Uh, so these courses do exist. Now, I, I, I agree, I, I see enormous interest from undergraduates, I see great interest from veterinary students. The interest among medical students has been a little harder to nurture. Now there is an MD PhD student who's working in Dave's lab right now who who, who gets it, but um, I think he's he's a rare exception. And you know, he's even tried to get me to lecture as part of the medical curriculum, and they can't seem to find find space for any one health lectures. So whereas in the vets, our, our veterinary curriculum is just the whole you know, the, the one health theme permeates through the entire curriculum. So there is a major difference there, and somehow we have to figure out how to address that. Sue. Thanks. I'm uh, Sue Vanderwood from Colorado State University. Great, great talk as usual, um, guys. I have a question about your comment about your lack of score for your NIH uh, collaborative grants, and I, I think that that's an issue relating to discovery of viruses or ecological research, and I'm wondering what solutions you're pursuing or you found for the potential lack of interest by NIH for funding some of these, these types of studies. Well, one thing we should have put on the slide uh, that was actually absolutely critical to us getting this off the ground was that we received pilot funding from the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery. No, uh, Wisconsin Institute for Infectious Disease. There's yeah. too many acronyms at Wisconsin. Um, but they uh, catalyzed this by funding, pro providing about two years of support for Michael Locke, my first student, to work on this project with joint mentorship. Uh, and that really let us get this off the ground. Uh, we've uh, looked at uh, funding through Department of Defense, through DARPA. Um, what else? Um, I, think, I think that that's about it. I, I've looked through funding through NSF. I have some funding for related work through uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and through the U.S. Geologic Survey, but not for primates. So um, it's, yeah, maybe we're in the stage where as these, this paradigm of pathogen discovery and model development gets underway, we need to look more broadly than NIH and keep plugging these success stories until there maybe is a, a NIH program that turns naturally occurring viruses into new animal models. We, we did have a student who, um, so Sam, was USGS. So we had one person who was working with us uh, the USGS was interested in ranaviruses and turtles, turtles, frogs, something not a monkey. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, he was funded for a period of time in, in Tony's lab to, to characterize, characterize those. And that, again, came out of this idea that they knew that we knew how to find viruses uh, and they needed someone to help do it. And so we were able to, you know, secure a little bit of student funding that way. Thank you. Uh, Philippe Beno with uh, Cornell University. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. And just like the preceding uh, speakers, a uh, great story. So to go back to the very first uh, speaker, what do you do to bring these great stories to the public in general and to our uh, politicians in particular who will fund you ultimately? Um, the, the communication part that, um, that Carolyn so nicely explained in, 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 uh, in the team building effort, uh, I find difficult to handle, maybe because I'm also a scientist, a veterinarian, uh, but it's so extremely important. Do you have a system to do that at uh, Wisconsin or elsewhere? I, I don't know if we have a system that's much different from the PR groups in any major academic institution, but I, I, I've thought about your question quite a bit, you know, how, how, what do we need as, as ammunition? I think we need some home runs. We need some really remarkable success stories where this approach has led to something that would not have been achievable through 
either the human medical approach or the ecological approach or the veterinary approach alone. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. Maybe we'll find a cure for AIDS and it will have originated in the wild primates of Uganda and that would be just the best story ever or, or maybe it's something we haven't even done yet. But I think we need to get together as a community and compile our best success stories and, and make them into elevator speeches and get that out as an as, as example. Because when you talk about One Health, there, there's a little bit of a doom and gloom side to it. It's, you know, the, the, the environment is changing, diseases are emerging, we're, run, we're you know, it, it's all doom and gloom. I, I think we need to figure out the flip side of that coin. What have we achieved that's going to, that, that really has moved global public health forward? I'm not sure what this Ma is. Well, about. yeah, maybe we can talk some more with Frankie. She, she seems to have an approach to that. Yeah. Right, so sticking with that analogy, I mean, you started off by talking about the origins of, <clears throat> of HIV, and you know, when you get down to it, it, for the baseball analogy, that is a grand slam. I mean, to know that it came from, the, you showed Beatrice Hans' picture, yeah. the, but you know, the, the detective work that she's figured out, that it began with a recombinant virus, you know, half red cap mangabe, half greater spot nose in a chimp, and that then carried forward into viruses that then learned how to break species barriers. So the, the, I think, you know, I had several discussions at the break with people who were sort of, how do we reach medical students? And the, and the question back there, how do you communicate this? So that's, that's such a powerful story. I mean, that, this disease that's killed close to 40 million people began with one chimpanzee and, and, a, and a recombinant virus. Um, so qu the question that I want to direct toward you, Tony, is you're out there looking at ongoing interactions between humans and non-human primates in, in Africa. I mean, um, the thought must have occurred to you that this could happen again and again. So how much do you worry about that? Because we're so myopic or medical. I think medical students and medical faculty can be very myopic. It's easy to focus on the problems that are right in front of you, much harder to focus on the potential problems. Uh, but AIDS looking back can inform us looking forward. But tell us about how much you worry about the next, uh, you know, the next AIDS epidemic. We didn't plant him here to answer ask this question, by the way. But what what you just outlined is exactly the strategy that Dave and I have been taking. Uh, we, we've argued that we should be learning. We should take to heart the lessons we learned from AIDS, and we should apply that to other pathogens going forward that have not yet emerged, pre-emergent pathogens, so to speak. And the simian arteriovirus, the simian hemorrhagic fever virus, and its relatives seem like likely candidates. There highly diverse RNA viruses that have an enormous amount of intra-host and inter-host genetic diversity. They replicate the high titers and populations of wild monkeys that are running around biting people. And you're like, what more do you want? This got every, every and, and yet, um, you know, it, I, it, it seems like th there is a sense of complacency. Oh, these viruses aren't known to infect people. So uh, I worry a lot. And I see clinical disease in people in the places where I work with histories of interactions with primates that look suspicious. Very hard to catch them in time, but we're, we're, what I mentioned Bill Switzer, my collaborator at CDC. We have a cross-section of about 1,000 people who've had risky interactions with primates in this part of Uganda, and we're looking at those to see if we can detect not only the retroviruses, but some of these other uh, more exotic agents. But I, I think you're spot on. Uh, Debbie Cochever, Tufts University. One of the earlier federal agencies that actually stood up and said One Health on a grant RFP was USAID. And so part of that effort is the PREDICT project, which is very much a, a virus hunting project. Is there much crosstalk across these funded groups? Yeah, yeah. so uh, there's a, an enormous number of players in that USAID PREDICT project. One of them is the EcoHealth Alliance. Wisconsin is one of the alliance members. So we're involved through that. I mean, I think they're, they, they do have a sort of a virus hunting arm, but they're not into developing animal models, and they're not, and most of their activities are about capacity building in country, which is extremely important. And I, you know, a lot of my students from Uganda have gone on to actually work for them and do stuff, and it's very good work. But this is, this is different. This isn't capacity building. It's not training. It's not just, you know, it's not just virus discovery. It, it's developing the next phase of the research, and that's where I think we're at a little bit of an impasse. Uh, just to link some of the topics from this morning together, to my knowledge, there's eight cancer-causing viruses in humans that have been uh, identified. Is there any linkage 
between your virus hunt and cancers of any sort? Well, there's, there's been a weak association between uh, the PEGI viruses and cancer uh, that was published last year by Jack Stapleton and colleagues, uh, which is the first known negative effect of any of the PEGI viruses. And so that's something that we're looking at. In a story that we didn't talk about, um, the, there are some common marmosets at the Wisconsin uh, Primate Center uh, that have died of unexplained lymphomas over the course of the last several years. And the pathologists and veterinarians believe that there might be an infectious origin. And in fact, there, there is another PEGI virus that does seem to be um, more, you know, at least in a small anecdotal subset of the animals, uh, it seems to be correlated with that. But we, it's way too early to say whether it's causative or whether that's, that's anecdotal or just coincidental. Um, but that's about as close as I think we have right now. And, and not, nothing from the wild that we've seen? It's not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so Andrew pointed out, you know, STLV and, and HTLV provide examples of that as well. 